to How to Build a Bank in 1500 Days. I'm Helene Panzerino, and I'm the Associate Director at the London Institute of Banking and Finance, and I'm delighted to be here. And eventually, I'm going to let the, my pa fellow panel members introduce themselves because I'm really delighted that they are here. In 2016, both of them, in opposite parts of the world, were off setting up two different banks, but two banks that eventually nearly four years later, have become that elusive unicorn with that over $1 billion valuation. They're shaking up financial services, they're posing a threat, they're being disruptive, and they've built amazing teams to take this forward. And we're going to find out, we're going to hear from these two co-founders how it's possible, what is the secret sauce that made them different and successful when we have so many banks that we can see that are being set up in recent years. Now, whether that's driven by regulation or by changing market conditions, obviously at the moment, some of that is driven by COVID and stimulus packages. It is true that everywhere we look, there are banks that are being set up, be that for individuals and individual communities or for SMEs. So before we get stuck into the topic, I would like to invite both of my panelists to introduce themselves. Chris, can we start with you? Yes, good afternoon or good morning, depending where you are in the world. It's certainly good e evening here in uh, in Melbourne. Lovely to be uh, with everyone here today. So I'm Chris Bayliss. I'm one of the co-founders of Judo Bank here in Australia. Judo is a, a challenger bank, actually. We would differentiate ourselves from a neo bank or a fintech. And it's a, a bank built on purpose. Its vision is to be the most trusted, uh, small and medium sized business bank here in Australia. Uh, not the biggest, but certainly the best. Music to my ears. I'm passionate about SMEs. Renaud? Yes, good morning. My name is Renaud Laplanche. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Upgrade, the US-based uh, neobank that's designed to deliver exceptional value to uh, uh, mainstream consumers in the US, including credit, uh, um, including affordable and, and responsible credit products again, for a mainstream US consumer. Neither of these are no small feat, and particularly given the circumstances that we're in, and credit, obviously, as we go forward over the next couple of years, is gonna be very interesting. So I'm really curious, as I said, and we know, there are literally globally dozens of applications, and I can myself have been approached probably by four or five people setting up new SME banks in the last couple of months. So with that as a backdrop, what was the unfulfilled consumer, customer need that you identified and what made you go after it? Renaud, do you want to start for us? Sure. So, I mean, we, when we, uh, we set up to build a, a neobank, uh, we looked at um, so really the main consumer needs and, and we found that uh, credit is so 70% of, of banks' revenue, and it's very often the number one reason why consumers uh, go to a bank, open a bank account with the hope of, of getting credit. And if you look at the neobank market in the US and, and Western Europe, um, a lot of them started from payments, deposits, savings. Um, so we said, okay, let's start with credit. If that's what we, uh, where we're gonna end up anyway, um, credit platforms don't get built in a, in a single day. It takes a long time to build a, a track record with credit. Um, and we said, okay, let's start with that and then expand from there. And it turned out to be, a, to be the right bet because we, we now have so three to four years of, of track record. We've issued billions of dollars, uh, close to four billion in, uh, in credit in your, uh, for US consumers. And we've been able to craft these you know, responsible and affordable credit products uh, that help consumers uh, do away with their traditional credit cards in, in particular that has done a lot of damage to a lot of uh, families in the US. Um, so we think the, the sort of affordability of the credit uh, and the fact that we started with credit and have expanded from there, um, I think have been the right um, strategy so far. Which is really interesting. I want to come back to the to the model that you have with regards to credit as well, because you know we can talk about financial education and about people's fear of of debt. But you've done something very unique, Chris. Let's let's understand from you what was it that made you think, yeah, this is it. What was that light moment? Well, I mean, the light moment, as you say, was was really the 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 recognition that in, in many regards there's been a market failure with regards to the finance available to SME, to the SME economy. And it's not just unique to Australia. It's something that's been playing out very much in other Anglo economies. 
and a lot of it was caused really by by the introduction in Bal two of the advantageous credit ratings for home lending. And so, if you look at the balance sheet of a typical of a typical Anglo-Saxon bank, you know there, there was a disproportionate amount of lending done to to businesses ten years ago, which has now completely swung to the consumer sector. And, and in Australia, here we have a we have a, a SME economy in terms of in terms of bank lending of about four hundred billion dollars. But a recent survey showed that SMEs have an unmet credit demand of a ninety of another ninety billion dollars on top of that. And that is funding that they're not just not able to access. And that's really because the major banks have pivoted to a preference to a particular type of asset class, which is a home lending. So if you're a, a, a small engineering company or a manufacturing company and, and you want to borrow a you know, million dollars to support your working capital and, and you don't have a home loan to provide as, um, or a, a property to provide a security, then it's very, very difficult to access that, that finance. So for us, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a back to the future model. It's doing it's reintroducing the craft of business lending that is undertaken by by human beings, by highly experienced business bankers, um, and we believe that that craft has has been lost. Well, as somebody who started out in commercial banking in the in the early nineteen eighties, well, when we learned our craft with a, a spreadsheet and a pen and a paper and a calculator, I'm totally with you, and I think I think that risk. And the lack of a secondary market and a lack of a good margin and difficult pricing has always meant that the SME market has suffered. Whereas, you know, as you said, the NEOs, the challenges, those with and without a banking license have come in off the back of payments, uh, foreign exchange, remittances, and then right. building up over time. And we will talk about your funding models because one thing that these guys are not actually doing is getting to any kind of profitability relatively quickly. Right. Although in the UK, we could say Starling Bank is heading that way. And that's a question from you also with regard to funding. I, I'd like to talk about the products. You know, can we go back to you? Because we spoke about credit. And, and as I said, we, and we, we know we're going to talk about COVID and what happens after this. How have you packaged up? What's been the differentiator in the type of the model for your products and services? Yeah, so I think the main instrument for U.S. consumers to get access to unsecured credit is a credit card, and and credit cards are horrible products. Right, they're um, they're fine payments uh, devices, but they're they're very bad credit products. And uh, the issue is a lot of consumers uh, get a new credit card as a payment uh, method, but they um, sooner or later they end up carrying a balance. And, uh, and then they, they start understanding that most credit cards are very high rates. So the average is about 17% interest rate on a credit card. Um, a third of uh, the income of credit card companies in the US comes from fees. So you take that 17% and you probably add another 50% in, uh, in, in fees. Um, and then the worst feature of, of credit cards is um, what the, the credit card issuers call the monthly minimum payment which is a very small uh, monthly payment that consumers have to make every month that covers the interest and the tiny fraction of the principal so that if you make only that monthly minimum payment, it's going to take you 25 years to pay off the balance and you'll end up paying back three times what you initially charged on, on the account. Um, and so for that reason, a lot of families have uh, really sort of uh, fallen into that uh, sort of endless um, revolving debt cycle trap. And there's more than a trillion dollars in, in credit card um, debt in the US. So when we, we wanted to launch a credit card, basically the only credit card that's good for you. Uh, so it's a, it's a card um, that uh, you can use um, at any point of sale uh, online or in store. It comes with a line of credit like any other credit card. But at the end of each month, the balance turns into an installment plan that pays down over one, two or three years at a fixed rate with fixed monthly payment uh, of principal and interest. So it really has the, the flexibility and the convenience of a credit card, uh, but also the much lower cost. So the rate starts at 6.99%. Um, so lower cost, no fees, and a much more responsible uh, payment schedule along a uh, sort of, uh, linear amortization. Fantastic. It's actually super novel. And I think that people, as you said, they got caught up and 17 is, is, is good in the States. Obviously, the, the rates are different. In some parts of the world, they can pay an average as high as in the 30s, right? And, and Chris, I'm sure that you've seen 
uh, some of the SME owners, particularly the small ones, the micros, the new one, using credit as their first line of defense and getting caught in this revolving door of extensive credit. As well. Was that in your thought process when you were designing your products? Yes, I, absolutely. I mean, I, th I think in many respects that that is what what's happened in terms of the provision of finance to SMEs, and that there's been this whole industrialization of process. Um, and with the big banks in that industrialization, what they've done is they, they've raised their minimum loan size up to, say, $250,000 to $500,000. And the fintechs have, have filled, it, filled that void at the lower end where it was sort of difficult for the big banks to make the economics work. But, but generally, you know, if, if I look here in Australia, the fintechs were almost exclusively serving the, the, the same sector, which is those companies that want to borrow, say, $50,000. It's generally double-digit interest rates. It's largely unsecured and it's largely for a tenure of, of under, under 12 months. But those businesses that want to borrow, you know, sort of two, three, four million dollars, they want to fund their, their working capital. It's debtors and stock, which is the balance sheet assets that they want to use to leverage. They don't want to put the family home up as collateral. And, and they actually want to tell their story to the bank. They don't want a computer says yes. They don't want a computer says no. They want to sit opposite a highly skilled, highly trained banker who's going to listen to their story and, and their plans and their aspirations and then tailor a solution for those specific needs. That, that, that service is, 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 is gone. And so that's very much what we wanted to bring back, which is, you know, the craft, the skill of, of lending. And so, yeah, look, it's not about it's not about product features as such. I think for businesses, a, a loan is a loan. It's about how it's structured. It's how it's priced. Um, it's about, you know, the security that, that's offered to, to support that loan. For Judo, you know, our average loan size is about two and a half million dollars. Um, you know, our average pricing is about four or five percent. Um, so it's not so it's a very, very different offering to sort of that 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 more automated, industrialized um, fintech model at the, at the lower end. We weren't there to service that. We wanted to service the, the core of, of small and medium sized businesses lending requirements. Fantastic. And I, and I suppose for both of you, the regulations, although they're here, they're more on this side and they're coming to the US, I'm sure, uh, where, where people are able to share their data, which makes it easier. They're able to share transaction data, both on the business and on, and on the personal side, makes it easier to get a better picture of someone. And also now with availability of alternative forms of data, although I think going forward, and I'd like your opinion on this, Smart metric data. We can't be working with the forensic data now. We need to be looking at the future proofing data, given what's been happening recently. What we knew a year ago, or what's on, on record a year ago, or what my habits were, my behavior, my resiliency, my vulnerability, won't be the same going forward. Do you think, what's your thought on that? Reno, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah, no, it's, uh, of course, yeah, it's uh, when you have a credit business, uh, data is paramount, right? Data and the, the algorithm that helps uh, sort of predict uh, future losses. And um, you're right, when, when, when someone comes to us for the first time, we have very little trending data. We have uh, spot data at that, that moment in time. Um, so, I mean, we do get historical data from, from the credit bureaus. We, we get last maybe three months of transactional data from the bank account, that's pretty much it. So uh, what we noticed is very often we, that first interaction would lead to a decline decision, uh, but then we, we like to uh, sort of keep um, declined applicant with it that sort of upgrade ecosystem. And we offer them um, sort of free credit monitoring, uh, free sort of credit education tools um, that, they, that they can use and as they're or sort of, uh, sort of continuing to monitor their credit and make we help them make good credit decisions. Uh, we're also monitoring them and we sort of start getting to know, uh, know them and uh, sort of get them on a path to a, an upgrade loan or upgrade card. Uh, that's the same strategy with our mobile banking uh, offering that's launching uh, in the next few weeks where sort of by offering a sort of DDA account, we, we can start learning about our, our customers and get them on the path to a, uh, to a yes. Fantastic. And Chris, I think on the yes, and, and actually both of you, I'm gonna ask you because both of these models, as I'm listening to you, there's a, there's a level of, of uh, human intensity, right? There's a bit more labor involved than just right. go running the algorithm and plugging everything in as we both said. 
and when it comes to your funders who have been very generous and really backing you and I think it's amazing there must be a discussion that goes on there saying uh you know you're you're um are we moving more towards digital and less towards the human being but uh, and Chris let's go back to you about about the data and the SMEs before we we step onto that yeah, I mean, look, I think, look, this is obviously where lending to consumers and lending to businesses is is, is, is quite different. Um, you know, I think with regard to small and medium-sized enterprises, that, that's a far less efficient market in terms of the provision of information. Like, you can't just do a bureau search and then decide whether you're going to lend or not. And that's why I think the major banks, in terms of their, 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 their drive to reduce cost, have just defaulted to property as, as collateral, um, to, to provide them with that sort of that, that comfort blanket, and and I think when you look at the plethora of fintechs that are coming into the SME market, this is the reason why you're seeing most most of are doing lend, lending between sort of zero and maybe a hundred two hundred thousand dollars at the very most, um, and it, and it's a model where you've got double digit interest rates because you're having to absorb relatively high high bad debts. I mean, sort of seven eight nine nine percent type bad debts. That's as a, Someone like ourselves, where you know we wouldn't expect our bad debts to be more than thirty or forty basis points. Right. So it is it is a lot harder to sort of just mine that data. It's absolutely um, open banking and the ability to you know to, through APIs now to scrape um, data from from accounting packages like the zeros of this world um, or scrape bank statements. They they will all help, but we don't believe that they replace the fundamental art. Of a, of a skilled business banker walking around the factory floor with the customer, checking that the forklifts are being used, seeing that the stock's turning over, talking about their business plans, assessing the management the management strength, and mm. then really getting down into the financials and assessing mm. cash flow and the working capital cycle, et cetera, et cetera. We think yeah. in the future, AI and all that has a, has a path to play, and that's a completely different topic that we could go into. And we're certainly building judo with the technology and, and the future capability to, to embrace um, that. But, you know, the... Um, well, the actually, Chris, that's... We, 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 um, we, we've, we're starting to overstay our welcome, I think, because I'm getting, I'm getting sounds from people saying, you know, we, although we could talk, I'm sure, for hours and hours, it's a good point that you make as we come to wrapping up about the future and about AI. And I know, I know you, AI features quite uh, significantly, again, with you. So looking forward to the future, what is going to be, if you could say this is going to be one game changing thing, for example, as we go forward into the next 18 months, two years, where we, we no, have no idea at this point, as you, we are going back to the future and back. If we were creating the future now, what's the one significant thing that you would bring to our attention? I know. Uh, um, if I if I take a micro uh, view of like upgrade specifically, I mean we for us it's really sort of making these three products of loans, credit cards, and uh, deposit accounts of work uh, sort of seamlessly uh, in the best interest of consumers, right? So, uh, so getting them all the value they can get, the full value they can get from a sort of full banking relationship. Wonderful, thank you. And Chris, we'll wrap with, finally with you. I, th I think, you've, you know, as you said, it, it's all about it's all about data going into the future. It's all about capturing the data um, that that can that can embrace the technology that's now available to us. And, and for Judo, starting that any legacy um, was one of our biggest strengths, right? That we've been able to build a, a, an entirely open cloud based um, technology platform, and we're able to to capture the data that our bankers are using today to inform them around the judgments that they're making. In yeah. the hope that in the future we can teach a machine to do that. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you, Chris Bayless, for La Planche. It's been my pleasure to discuss judo and upgrade with you. Thank you to the audience. I hope that you enjoy the session. Thank you. Thank you.